Hi and welcome to C3 Yorks Online. It is so good to have you with us today. And uh, we know wherever you are tuning in from, please do say hi in the comments. Let us know, uh, you know, where you're watching from, who you're watching with, uh, and, a, and if you're making, you know, C3 Yorks your home, please do get in touch. Let us know that you're watching. Head to c3yorks.church/connect, and you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, or if you want to ask for prayer, or you want to ask some questions about faith or the life of our church, then we'd love to be able to get back in touch with you. Hey, we've got a great message coming up in just a minute from one of our leadership team, Lucy Shaw. And so she's going to be sharing. But before we do that, let's get into uh, a moment of worship. Let's fix our thoughts and our hearts on God. And so the band are going to lead us in a couple of songs. So I do encourage you, engage in this moment. And uh, let me pray as we enter into worship. Father God, we thank you for today. And Lord, we come before you today to lift up your name to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, we exalt you, we worship you, we love you, Lord. Help us to put all other things aside right now so that you would have our only focus, Lord, as we give you glory right now in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus you brought
so much power in your name oh oh just the word of your name just the mention of your name oh it changes everything it changes everything yes the power of your name the power of your name oh it changes everything Changes everything. Oh, we believe in your name. We believe. We believe in your name, Jesus. We believe. We believe in the power of. We believe. We believe in the power of your name. Oh, what a beautiful name, Jesus. What a beautiful name, Jesus. Beautiful name, Jesus. Forever boast in the name that is Jesus. We'll forever boast in the name of Jesus. All your glorious name. It's the only name by which we sing. The only name by which we sing. The only name that holds so much power. The name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Hey church, it's great to be with you today. So whenever I'm down to preach, I do actually get myself a bit worked up. Um, If I'm honest, I put a lot of pressure on it and I think to myself, I've got to bring something that's going to really blow your mind. Um, Yeah, I'm thinking, why me? I have got nothing. (laughs) More often than not, when I'm preparing a message, it actually will come from a life lesson that I've recently been on with God. But it can take me a while to actually realise what that might be. So on this occasion, in the weeks leading up to preparing this message, I decided to ask my four-year-old, Evelyn, what shall mummy tell the grown-ups in church about Jesus? And as you can see, I was feeling a bit unsure myself. So I'd like to think that it was the Holy Spirit who set us up because Evelyn actually came out with, mummy, you should tell the grown-ups about the time when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And I was actually quite surprised she came out with this story. I can't actually think that I'd recently talked to her about it. So I asked her, what's so special about this story that the grown-ups need to hear? And her reply was, Jesus loves them, he wants to help them, and he wants them to help each other. So here I am today to tell you just that. So obviously I then took some time studying this scripture. And through what she said and my time spent with this scripture... I've been thinking about what it means to be one of the disciples back then and what it means for us today being a disciple now. And there we have it. We've got to preach. (laughs) So let's get into the story. It's found in John 13, verse 1 to 17. I would love for you to open your Bibles with me or look at your app on your phone and take a look at the actual scripture and follow it through. I am reading from the New Living Translation. Okay. So before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that this hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was his time for supper. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. 
Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from the Father and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had round him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands, my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew he would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Okay, so let's set the scene here. This has happened when it's Jesus's final week and it's just before the Passover meal. And we know from the other accounts in Matthew and Mark and Luke that they're in, the, in someone's house in Jerusalem and they're in a large room upstairs. So in very basic terms, the Passover meal is a Jewish celebration which happens um, every year and it commemorates when the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. And that's what we read about in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. And it would be so important for the disciples and for Jesus to have this Passover meal together because of their Jewish beliefs and upbringing. So this year, like every year, they're about to enjoy this feast together. And it's taken place just before Jesus was arrested and then crucified. So you'll see it referenced as your, in your Bible often as the Last Supper. And you might be able to picture that image that's quite famous from Da Vinci of the Last Supper painting where they're all on this long table and Jesus is in the middle. And that's kind of like an image for you now to think about. But what can we actually learn from this story? I've got a few points for us today, but the first point I want to delve straight into is that Jesus loves his disciples. It says it right at the very beginning, before the Passover celebration, this is verse one, Jesus knew that the hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. And then listen to this, he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he loved them to the very end. You know, Jesus knew what's about to happen and he knows he's about to be put to death. Yet here he is, putting himself, his own feelings, his fears, his anxiety, whatever he might be thinking about what's going on, to one side, ready just to spend time with his disciples and focus on them. He doesn't let the opportunity pass him by and he's present with them. He's ready to celebrate the Passover with them. And why do you think he does this? It's because he loves his disciples. He values them. He values what they value, this Passover celebration together. Um, He values time with them. He values relationship with them. Jesus loves all of his disciples, warts and all. So if you look at the disciples, they're not perfect people by any, any stretch of the imagination. Because despite moments of their unbelief, like when they were caught in the storm and Jesus had to calm it, or when Peter walked on water and Jesus had to pull him out, and he said to things like, why do you have so little faith? So despite their lack of faith, he still loved them. Despite their denials, you know, we hear that about Peter being um, asked if he, if he knew Jesus and he denies him three times. Despite their pride, we can read the story about when um, the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest disciple. And then even despite their betrayals, and in this story, it's, it's sort of referencing how Judas is about to betray Jesus. And there's actually a footnote in my Bible, which um, 
which is on verse 1, and it says he loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them until the very end, until he showed the full extent of his love. The full extent of his love being the death on the cross and his resurrection, because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice so we can live in relationship with God free from sin. So the full extent of Jesus' love is what he's about to do on the cross. The fact that John has written this, who's one of the disciples as well, just highlights to me that he really did feel loved by Jesus. That's how the disciples felt. So for us today, being a disciple of Jesus, we need to know that too. Jesus loves us just as we are, despite everything, warts and all, in our imperfections, in our lack of faith, in our times of doubt, in our denial. He loves us. We don't have to be all sorted and perfect to come to Jesus. No, we come to Jesus just as we are. And he loves us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to spend time with us. He values you. And he wants you to know him. And just like the footnote in my Bible says, the full extent of Jesus' love is revealed to us by the death on the cross and the ultimate sacrifice that he made for us so we could live free from sin and in relationship with him. So not only is Jesus' love for us, but it's for others too. It's for our friends, family, neighbours, people that we meet. It's for everyone. And as his disciples, he calls us to love the people in our world. Just like Jesus spent time with his disciples, showing up for them and his friends, being present and valuing them, we can do that too for our friends. Just show up for your friends. It's really simple. Being present with them, valuing them, loving them, taking time, noticing them, seeing them. And not only for your friends, but for the people in your world. You know, it's quite countercultural sometimes to just go against the grain and really be loyal to someone or really just encourage them or really stand with someone, especially if it's someone that you wouldn't normally or naturally be seen with. Um, and, And that's what we're called to do. We're called to go and love the people around us. The second thing that we can learn from this story is that Jesus shows grace and mercy. So let's read verse two now. It was time for the supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So there's something in this room that is so much greater than the devil and the betrayal. And that's grace and mercy. The work of grace and mercy in this room is so much greater than the work of the devil and this betrayal. Jesus knows that he's about to be betrayed by Judas. And he knew what was really going on with all of each of his disciples, including Judas. Yet, He doesn't distance himself. He doesn't discriminate. He doesn't leave him out. He doesn't argue with him. He doesn't alienate Judas, which would be quite easy to do. He could have just done the rest, you know, seen to the rest of them and gone, not today. Um, But he actually shows so much grace and mercy, spending time with him and treating him exactly the same as the other disciples, even to the point of washing his feet. That's the power of grace and mercy. It enables us to look beyond someone's wickedness and love and serve them anyway. Jesus extends so much grace and mercy towards us. And that is the ultimate power of the cross that we've already talked about in point one. But the ultimate power of the cross was the grace and mercy. So, you know, we get things wrong. We mess up. We have an attitude problem. We can be grumpy. We can say the wrong thing. We can be mean. We can hurt people. We can be impatient. (laughs) Yet Jesus has grace and mercy for us. And it doesn't mean that we should carry on doing the things and living like this or just messing up anyway because there's grace for it and there's mercy for that. No, the purpose of knowing that there's grace and mercy for us as a disciples is for us to be free and live more like Jesus. So rather than just allowing ourselves to keep doing these things, repent and allow the grace and mercy Jesus has for us to actually move forward, not living in guilt and shame and fear, but to walk in freedom and just becoming more like Christ each and every day. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, it says this, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now, I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. It's the power of Christ 
when we allow the grace in us to work, the grace from him just to be the grace that we have on our lives, but also to extend it to the people around us. Sometimes it means that we have to overlook someone's bad attitude or the thing that they said when they were hurting. And it can be so hard. Extending grace and mercy can look different in different relationships and circumstances. And it can be quite a hard thing to navigate and it's really complicated. Forgiving someone is a lot more difficult than we might like it to be. And I don't want to underestimate how difficult this can be. And there's so many different life issues and scenarios where grace and mercy is needed. I think actually in everything we need grace and mercy. So the point of this is actually... If, if you're feeling like, as I'm saying this point, something or a situation or someone comes to mind, I think you need to take that prayerfully to God and really consider why and what it is that you might need to do. Why is this thing come to my mind? Why is this person in my mind right now? And if you aren't sure from spending time with God, reading the scriptures and prayer, what your next step might be, I'd suggest you seek wise counsel. Talk to another disciple about it or speak to someone on the leadership team. We've got time for you. It's really hard navigating this sort of stuff, but we're in it together as a body of believers. And the same grace and mercy that, that Jesus puts on us is what we want to extend to the world around us as well. The third thing that we can learn from this story is that Jesus has both authority, humility, and a servant heart. So let's read verse three to five now. Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around them. You know, verse three makes it pretty clear, doesn't it, that Jesus knows exactly who he was, who he is. He is the son of God. He's come from God. He's going to return to God. And then the fact that he then performs a ton of miracles. So just before we get to this mealtime, Jesus, if we read our New Testament, Jesus has performed a ton of miracles, of signs and wonders. He's healed people. He's provided lunch for thousands of people. He's provided so much for so many people who've come to him. Um, and, and he's cast out demons and he's done all these things that reveal who he is. He's had crowds following him everywhere just to get close to him. He's caused quite a stir and he was doing things. He's got the power. He is God's son and he is God. All authority was his. However, even in his authority, he was able to humble himself, be who God truly wanted him to be. So not be like, oh, I'm like this mighty man who can perform all these miracles and do all this stuff. But actually, he's able to take off his robe, wrap a towel around his waist and wash their feet. Verse four actually says, so he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel. And the fact that it starts with that word so implies that because of the sentence before, he's able to do this. And the sentence before being verse three, which says Jesus knew he was the far, that the father had given him authority, that verse. So the, the, the verse about Jesus having authority and being from God, God's son and going back to God, because of that verse, so he was able to do what he was going to do and wash their feet. It was because Jesus knew who he was that he was able to act in that way. He was able to fully serve. So it says in verse 4 to 5, So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped his towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that he had around him. So at the time when this happened, you know, I'm going to state the obvious, there weren't cars, <laughs> no one wore trainers, the roads weren't how they look now. They were pretty dusty, people wore sandals and barefoot, and they would walk for hours on these sort of desert lands. And it meant that people's feet were filthy, can you imagine? And um, as they entered a person's home, it was tradition or it was cultural, or I don't know what the word is, you know, it was the normal, <laughs> that the person's home, the host themselves, would wash their feet, or the servant from that home would wash 
the feet of whoever enters. But Jesus reveals who he is by this act because he shows that he came not to be served, but to serve others. He shows he's humble despite being the son of God. So he has all authority, yet he's still able to serve in this way. He shows grace. He shows he's able to wash Judas's feet, knowing that he would later be betrayed. And he shows that he's more focused on what God wants him to do than what the society would expect him to do. So rather than just coming in and allowing the servant to wash their feet, he was more focused on what God has asked him to do and the call of God on his life, which was to serve those disciples in that room. And the same can be said for Jesus on the cross. Jesus reveals who he is by what he did on the cross. He shows he came to serve and not to be served. He shows he's humble despite being the son of God. And he shows the full extent of grace being able to die for me and you, knowing that we have all sinned and that we don't deserve it. It shows that he is more focused on fulfilling what God wants him to do than his own agenda. But authority, it can easily go to your head. Not Jesus, but it can easily go to my head. It can probably easily go to your head. It can make you act above people. It can make you show off a bit, be a bit proud, maybe be a bit bossy. I'm definitely that with my kids, for sure. (laughs) But not Jesus. He knew that he had authority and he knew who he was, yet he was still able to act humbly. It's important for us to know and recognise who we are in Christ because when we do realise who he says we are over everything else, and the Bible tells us so many things about who we are, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, we're a son or daughter of the Most High King, we're adopted into his family, we're chosen, we're called, we're favoured. It says so many things about who God says we are, a new creation. So when we know who we are like that, and then taking Jesus as our example, we can't let this idea of self get in the way or go to our head, get in the way of what God wants us to do. Have you ever heard someone actually being rude to someone, saying something that just wasn't nice, and then going, well, it's just who I am. They just need to get over it. This idea of self, like I'm, I'm, that's just the way I am. It's their problem to get over with. No, we need to be better than that. We need to be loving, kind, gracious, merciful. We can't excuse ourselves when we act badly or just plain rude to someone because it's how we are, deal with it. God wants us to live a different way. In Colossians 3, verse 10 to 17, it says, Since God chose you to be holy people, he loves You must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself in love, which binds all things together in perfect harmony. This scripture sounds lovely, doesn't it? When you first read it, you're like, oh yeah, that's so nice, clothe yourself in all these lovely things. But if you really see what it's saying here and you really want to take it on board, it packs a punch. Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Clove yourself in all those things. I definitely need to do better with patience. Um, But all those characteristics that he's listed here, we see in Jesus And by this act of feet washing, he really displays humility. And, you know, we can't underestimate just how totally bizarre and weird and countercultural that this moment would have been for those disciples in the room. It shouldn't be Jesus doing this task. It should be the servant or the host of the house. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God and he's washing the feet. To be like Jesus, we need to have a strong sense of our identity whilst being completely humble as well. No longer self-righteous, no longer doing what we want to do, acting exactly how we want to do and saying what we want to do, but being humble and allowing our relationship with God to be the thing that makes us humble 
And it's our relationship with God that actually makes us righteous because it's his righteousness. It's what he's done for us. That's what makes us righteous. And so the fourth thing that we can learn from this story is that Jesus leads us even when we don't understand. That's good to know, isn't it? (laughs) So verse 6 to 11, we read this exchange between um, Jesus just as he gets to wash Peter's feet. Um, And he says, Lord, are you going to wash mine? And Jesus' response is, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but someday you will. And Peter protests back, no, you will never wash my feet. But we see that Jesus goes on to wash his feet. Peter didn't fully understand why is my friend who I have seen and I know who he is, why is he, why is he washing my feet? He was his Lord. He protested saying no to Jesus. But then he did go on to let him wash his feet. Because even though he didn't fully understand what he was doing, like why, why is he doing this? To, you know, why does he think he should do this? It was something considered so lowly something a servant would do he did recognize Jesus as Lord so he did let Jesus lead not long after this when Jesus was put to death on the cross the disciples must have been so confused watching this man who they'd followed who they'd believed in who they'd seen perform all these miracles die why has this happened is he not God Surely he could have just got down. Surely he could have sent his angels. Surely, surely not. Surely he's not meant to just die. We've been following him all this time. Why didn't he just reveal himself there and then? Maybe they even wondered, is he even God? But just as Jesus said to Peter then, you don't fully understand now what I'm doing, but you will. Three days later, after his death, Jesus is resurrected and he reveals himself to the disciples. The understanding comes. He is Lord. He is the saviour. He is able. Have you ever found yourself like Peter? Maybe, just a bit, a few times maybe. Not understanding why is this happening? What's going on here? Really confused at God. Why am I here? What is going on? Why me? Not fully understanding or understand or um, understanding might not come in the moment, but it comes later. Like Peter, we have a choice. We can protest and we can reject Jesus. We can say, no, I'm going to do it my way. I don't understand that way. I'm going to do this thing or I'm going to go for this or I'm just, I can't, I can't do that. Or we can be like Peter when he then submits to his lordship and leadership we can submit to Jesus's lordship and leadership in our life even when we don't fully understand even when we don't get what he's doing we can trust in him above and through all situations and circumstances the first step for you today might just be to recognize him his as your lord or it might be acknowledging acknowledging him and again giving back control letting him take control of a situation that you find yourself in letting him lead you again. The fifth thing that we can learn from this story is that Jesus sets the example for us. The final verses, 12 to 17, after having washed all of the disciples' feet, is where we read about how Jesus says, this is my example. But remember, as he's, as he's washing their feet, he washes their feet, then he's drying them with the towel that's round the waist, and there's 12 of them. This must have taken a bit of time. It doesn't tell you if there's any conversation going on in the room. I would like to imagine that they're sort of like eyeballing each other, like, what is he, why is, what is he doing? Like, okay, this is weird. Has he lost the plot? Like, I don't know. But there's 12 of them. So he's gone through them all. It would have taken a bit of time. So they've been a bit confused for a while. They don't know why. He's done it the first one. Why are you doing that? Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? fifth disciple in still don't know why he's doing that still don't know he's doing all of this and it's not until he's finished washing all of their feet that he finally explains his actions and uses it as a teaching opportunity I love that Jesus does it in this order actually firstly because I love to think of the disciples like what's going on (laughs) Um, but also it shows that Jesus first acts 
by washing the feet, doing the example before telling them. Jesus is someone who walks the walk and then talks the talk. And then the talk really means something because he's just done this thing. And the same goes for us. The simplest example I could give to you about setting an example is trying to get my kids to do something. If I was trying to get them to do something when I don't do it myself, it's so much harder because the kids are like, what? what's that about? Why? But if, if we set a sort of tone in our household where me and Tom are always doing something or this is how we act and this is how we, you know, this is how we have meal times together, the kids then catch on. Because so much of what we learn and know is caught rather than taught. So, so much of what my children and how they act and who they are is because of what they've caught around, you know, me and Tom and the key people in their lives. They learn from the examples that we set. And you know what? (laughs) This is a learning example for us and it's one of the best ways to learn. So as believers, it's about our whole lives being an example, not just a portion, not just doing this good deed and going, yep, that's my good deed done for the week, check. Not just attending church, yep, Christian today, check. But actually, our whole lives being devoted to living out this call of God on them. So it's not a portion, it's not just telling people what to think and sounds good, but it's actually being a true Christian, setting an example, all those things that are said in, um, from Colossians, clothing ourselves with tender-hearted mercy, um, kindness, love, patience, all those things. It's being that week in, week out, day out, day out. This doesn't make sense, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. All the time. <laughs> and that is how Christ is revealed in our lives, through the actions and the way we live. John 13 verse 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How we act toward one another and how we act towards the people in our world is so important because here it says it, it will prove to the world that you are my disciples and it shows Jesus in us. Jesus didn't wash the disciples' feet to be an example for us for just those 12 disciples in the room at the time. But as a disciple today, he washed their feet, those 12 feet, as an example for you and I too. I'm just going to dive back into the scripture. So John 13 verse 14 to 17 says, And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Jesus has given us an example to follow, as plain as day, and he's even told us there in the scripture, it's an example, do as I have done to you. And, you know, it would be a bit strange for us to say, right, come on, get the water basin out, get me towel and start washing your feet. But the example he sets for us here is to humble ourselves and serve people, despite everything. So what does it mean to serve people? Well, first of all, it's something that we can all do. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself, you can serve in your workplace, in your families, in your friendships, in your marriages. You can serve in church, serving throughout everything that you do. It's like a lifestyle thing. To serve does come at a cost. You know, you might have to go out your way a bit more or be a bit more thoughtful or take a bit more time with God just to sort out your attitude problem. But the reward is so much greater. Because when you serve people, it changes the world around you. It changes how you see people. It changes how your life is. But it also changes you too. But, you know, I've got to have to say it, I do feel like serving has become a bit of a taboo. And as a leader in church, you know, I run run the kids team, I struggle to ask people sometimes, like, can you help out? Can you serve on this week? Because I'm worried of where people are at and how they might receive my request. But this is really key. And it's something I've had to work through. As disciples, we can't let it be or become a trigger for us. The word serving or serve cannot be a trigger. 
And if it is, I totally, totally get it, but we don't want to stay there. We can't remain triggered there by it forever. We need to be able to talk about it. We need to work through it. So today, if, if that's you, I would, I would say, you know, prayerfully consider it. Talk to the leadership team or talk to other disciples about it. Let's work through this thing together. But today, as I'm specifically talking about serving right now, if you're finding this a bit triggering or a bit tricky, just switch the word serve for the word help. Because it doesn't, I don't know, it just feels a bit better sometimes. So funnily enough, after my chat with Evelyn, after the story and reading the story, I was reflecting about it and um, God actually reminded me of something that had recently happened. Um, And I was feeling a bit worked up and I was sorting stuff out in kids and, you know, busy, busy, busy as, as life is. And I'd just become a bit worn out. I'd spent a lot of time in kids recently, and although I absolutely adore kids' ministry, I was feeling a bit frustrated, and I don't know, I just got myself in a bit of a funk about it. And I found myself in a really bizarre moment, just uh, like that, you know, when you just, it just comes out. And I was pegging the washing out, and I just went, it was quite loud. (laughs) Just be careful on the mic now. But anyways, that's, it happened, it happened to me. And God reminded me of that as I was writing this message. Because it can be so hard to remain humble, to do it gladly, to stay faithful. And we can get so tired and frustration and frustrated. And at the time, what I did, I actually kind of got my emotions out. I prayed about it. I did have a moment, listened to a bit of worship, really thought about what's going on. I talked to Tom about it. And then I kind of dug back down to the root of why I love serving. Why do I love kids ministry? Why do I love serving the kids in this way? And so then I carried on (laughs) and it was okay. For me in that scenario, I had to deal with my attitude before I could then continue serving and helping in kids that Sunday. And thankfully I did because um, I then went into kids ministry with just this whole fresh outlook and I just went and gave it everything I could. And that particular day, I had a little boy who hadn't been for a while, hadn't seen him for maybe even a couple of months. And as he came in, he was like, "Mm, no, don't want to do that. No, not doing that. And he was opting out of everything that I had planned. And it would be really easy for me to go, well, fine, that's fine. Or really easy for me to become disheartened in that situation. But do you know what? Instead, I served him. I spoke to him about it. We worked it out together. And by the end of it, he was a completely different child. It was amazing. It was actually quite amazing. And it, was, it, it made the whole thing, all my struggle that week worthwhile just to see that one child go from being you know quite grumpy and agitated and not wanting to do anything to actually hearing the word of God and being transformed by it throughout that morning in kids it was one of my favorite Sundays in kids and I can't say it was anything out of the ordinary it was just me choosing to get over myself and spend the time that God had asked me to do to serve this child see this cheeky attitude just being changed and soft and sweet and I said to him at the end you know I'm so proud of you and he was just like goo he was just so chuffed to bits and you know since then he's come back to kids and and I I get him he understands me and we've got a great relationship and it's brilliant and he loves coming to kids so back to the scripture today Jesus had not just performed loads of miracles, healings, provision. He was now sat in the upper room with his disciples, knowing that one of them is going to betray him, knowing that he's going to be crucified, and yet he still chooses to serve them all the same, treat them all, all the same. In doing that, he not only sets the example for us, but he totally shows his love. Jesus always served, and by serving, he showed his love until he showed us the full extent of his love on the cross. What Jesus did was countercultural. He didn't come to help himself, but he came to help others. To serve, and for us to serve, is to be like Christ. To serve is to be a disciple. To serve 
is to show love, to serve is a privilege. And if you didn't like any of that, to help is to be like Christ. We can serve and we can help people within so many different contexts. Our family, you know, taking time to help an elderly family member, asking them, what do you need me to do for you? How can I help? Our neighbours, our spouse, you know, we have to serve in marriage. It's not something that comes easy. We have to look out for each other and, and both commit to doing that for each other. Serve our community. You know, if you see something, just, just get on and do it if there's a need there. I think what's so cool around Leeds, you always see the, the, you know, the litter pickers out with their purple bags. That's a community thing. If you want to do it, you just jump on board and do it. There's a whole Facebook page and everything. It's, it's people seeing a need and going, I can do that. I can be that. I can help there. What about in your school? Being, being the person that you know, stands up for someone in school or if you're a school mum or dad, maybe just seeing the need like, oh, you know, this, this needs doing. There needs a bit of money raised for this or they need a bit of help here. In our workplace... There's tons of things you can do within the workplace. And the same goes for church. Where I've got it wrong in the past is when my approach to serving is thinking that I can do everything um, all the time and trying to be everything for everyone and not setting those sort of healthy boundaries where I actually do just retreat a bit and just take a time to refresh um, or just not communicating properly. So just going, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll sort that. Yeah, that's fine. When actually I've got a bit too many things and someone else needs to help with this or do that. And so, you know, and, and also not having Sabbath rest. And we've got a series about that coming up in a few weeks. So we need to set some sort of healthy, um, healthy goals around our serving, but know that we can all do it. But getting our head in the right place when it comes to serving is a really good place for us to start. We can only do it for an audience of one. So if you're feeling stressed about serving, let's just go back to Jesus. Let's just speak to Jesus, ask him what the need is. Sometimes there's things placed on our heart with frustrations that we have are quite often the ones are there because we're the ones who need to fill that gap or need to ones who need to advocate for that. And just like just a reminder again, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so the same goes for us. What you do Monday to Sunday, week in, week out, is, is where you can now start looking for ways to serve and find joy in it. Spend time in, with Jesus. Ask him, how can I be used this week? And just, and just go out there and be who Jesus has called you to be loving people and the world around you, meeting the need of the world around you, filling the gap, being the voice, being who Jesus wants you to be. So in conclusion, I've had five points. I've said an awful lot, but this message boils down to what my four-year-old says. Jesus loves you. He came to help you and he wants you to help others. Let's get to know Jesus more. Let's allow him access into our lives to help us. And then let's take time to help others. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you, you do this so often in scripture where you, um, you give us a picture. You give us an example. You show us exactly how you want us to live. Thank you, God, for Jesus and this, this amazing scripture that we've read today. Thank you that it's as true today for us disciples as it was then. And Father God, would you uh, reveal yourself to us through this scripture once again today, how you love us, how you love us, how you forgive us, have grace and mercy for us, how you first serve us and how we are able to serve and help the people in the world around us. Father God, just help us to see people today. Help us to notice areas where, you know, we can fill in the gap, Lord God, where we can be the difference, Lord God. And Father God, would you bless your people? Would you fill us afresh, Lord Jesus? Lord God, thank you for who you are today and always. Amen.
what a great message from Lucy that was. And, uh, you know, look, if you are uh, got questions about faith, and maybe today you are wanting to make a decision to follow Jesus yourself, uh, why don't you head to c3yorks.church slash connect and get in touch with us. And we'd love to be able to help you on those next steps. And, uh, and also, you know, if you are based in one of our locations, uh, in-person gatherings, if you're in Leeds and York and you'd like to get more involved, if you'd like to be able to help, uh, or serve in some capacity or you know maybe you've always kind of questioned whether you know you, you're kind of qualified hey okay, look there's opportunities for every person and uh, and you know if you'd like to get more involved in something that's technical we will help train we'll 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 do what we can to help you uh be a help to others and so uh head to why head to head to our website head to see through yorks.church slash connect and uh, let us know on that form hey uh final act of worship today is to bring our tithes and offerings and so all the details are on the screen right now uh, for you to be able to give and as always thank you so much for your generosity thank you for uh, everyone who does give uh, faithfully week in week out and as always you know your giving does help us continue to do what we're doing here today but first and foremost it is our worship to god it's trusting him with the first fruits of all that we, we earn. And so I uh, really encourage you to do that now as we close our service. I uh, hope you're enjoying the weather for those of you in the UK and uh, continue to do so over this summer. Uh, we'll see you next week with a message from Gosha Denham. So uh, have a great week and I'll see you soon. God bless.